Well, good morning, everybody. It's a joy to be with you. As you know, Pastor James is uh, on vacation, and he's kindly asked me to offer today's message. So let's uh, begin with prayer and ask God to prepare our hearts and minds. Lord God, we come to you as your people, gathered together around your word. And we ask that by your spirit, you will open our hearts and minds so that we may hear and respond faithfully. Encourage and direct our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Jane and I have just returned from a short vacation in Whistler. And as you may know, it's just a spectacular place for all sorts of reasons. And we walked, as we typically do, along a few of the trails that are there. And I was reminded again of at least a couple of things. First, the glory, the beauty of God's creation. And secondly, that life is, as Jane often tells me, a journey. It has its twists and turns. It has its mountain highs and its valley lows. And we can't always see what lies ahead. But we are to walk faithfully in the light that God does give us, focused on Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. Our main text today, and Emmanuel has just kindly read it for us, is Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. This, I think, is one of the most intriguing and important passages in all of the Bible. It tells us about two disciples. They are journeying back from Jerusalem to their home village of Emmaus. They are grieving. Grieving because Jesus, the one that they had hoped would be Israel's Messiah, has just been crucified. And they think that his death is the end of the all. And so they must return to their all too ordinary lives, having just witnessed the extraordinary ministry of Jesus, but now with all their dreams and hopes dashed. But along the way, they unexpectedly meet the now risen Jesus. But initially, they don't recognize that it's him. It's only after Jesus first explains the scriptures to them and then shares a meal with them that they realize it is he. And at that point, their lives are truly, dramatically transformed, and they're empowered to proclaim the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. Simply put, then, that's the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we could just leave it there. But this would be a very short sermon. And uh, besides, there's a little bit more detail, a few more pieces of the puzzle that we have to fill in so that we can see the bigger picture. And perhaps more important even than that, we need ourselves to take a little time to walk with these disciples, to journey alongside Jesus, so that we too can learn how to read the scriptures faithfully and how to be in communion, that is in deep fellowship, with Jesus and his followers. Now, to put ourselves in a better position to do that, we're going to go right back to the beginning of Luke's gospel. And we're going to take a very quick look at the agenda-setting opening few verses. Here they are. I'm going to read them. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself had carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too, this is Luke, decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. The prologue basically tells us what Luke's gospel is all about. 
It's a narrative witness to a divine drama centered on Jesus, his death and resurrection as the culmination. Luke wants to persuade the reader, in the first instance, Theophilus, but also by extension, all readers, we today, that they can be confident of the truth of the gospel. And Luke's gospel is truthful in several senses. We often have a rather low-level understanding of truth. Two plus two is four. Well, that's true, and it's important that it is true, but that's a rather narrow understanding of truth. A biblical understanding is much more all-encompassing and dynamic. In fact, as I try to suggest here, Luke's gospel is true in many and various ways. It's true that the events took place. It's true that they were witnessed firsthand by many of Jesus' contemporaries. It is true that they are represented, Jesus' life and ministry is represented in this well-ordered account written by Luke, and this gospel is true in that it can transform our lives. The truth of God's gospel entails all of these things. This is truth, then, on a grand scale. Better remember to click this thing. Um, so the gospel, this gospel, Luke says, truly relates the things that have been fulfilled among us. Well, what things? Well, here then, of course, we have to scan the, the scope of Luke's entire gospel. It begins with the baptism of Jesus. And then we see Jesus' dramatic deeds and word, words and deeds as they unfold across the pages of the gospel. And things begin to build up. The crowds are curious. Then they're concerned and there's some conflict. And eventually there's a conspiracy which ends in Jesus' crucifixion. Things are escalating in that direction. And so we fast forward to the end of Luke's gospel, to the chapter 24, which relates in a series of scenes Jesus' dramatic resurrection. In the first scene, which we didn't read earlier, but I've posted the text here on the screen, we see certain faithful women who, verse 10 will later tell us, include Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and some of the other women. They visit Jesus' tomb. They find that the tomb is empty. But two men who are described in ways that indicate they are actually attending angels remind them of Jesus' earlier teaching throughout the course of his ministry. And that teaching is summarized in verse 7, where Jesus says, The Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. So the women are given this divine revelation and reminder. They rush off to tell the apostles, who, verse 11 tells us, did not believe them. The women often marginalized in that society, bear faithful witness. The apostles do not, at least in the first instance, believe. The second scene, then, in this chapter is the one that we have just read, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We summarized it, but I'm going to dig into a little bit more of the detail now, highlighting some of the key features in terms of a series of questions that we can consider. Well, what is the scenario, scenario that is in view here? We can start out by taking a look at the setting and the participants and perhaps some of the key issues involved. The setting is on the very same day. That is the same day that the women went to the tomb and found that it was empty. And we've got two people, Cleopas, as Carolyn said. Cleopas is one of the named disciples here, but the other one, strangely, is not named at all. 
Some commentators think it might actually be Cleopas' wife. That's possible. We can't be sure. In any event, they are walking from Jerusalem to their home village of Emmaus. That's about seven miles. In Jesus' time, there were no planes, trains, or automobiles. People normally traveled near and far by foot. And remarkably, along the way, they meet the risen Jesus, but they don't recognize him. That's strange. In fact, we're told in verse 16 that they were kept from recognizing him. That's interesting. Kept? How so? Likely in part because they've only got a limited understanding at this stage. They've only got some of the pieces in play, and they're not yet arranged in the way that they need to be to see the big picture. They need to see God's greater plan and purpose as it unfolds. What about some of the key issues involved? Well, uh, Jesus asks the two disciples a couple of leading questions. What are you discussing? He says. One of the disciples, Cleopas, apparently wondering why this person is, seems so clueless, responds by asking himself, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here? But Jesus continues to play dumb, and he follows up with another question. What things, he asks. And by this point, the uninitiated reader should be asking themselves, well, what is going on here? And so we need to read on with a second question in view. How do the disciples respond to Jesus' questions? Well, they reply by relating the story of Jesus' public ministry as they currently but inadequately understand it. Jesus was from Nazareth, they say. That's like being from Chilliwack. I was going to say Aldergrove, but that would get me in trouble with some of the worship team. And then I was going to say Abbotsford, but I'm looking at Glenn and Jackie, and that's not going to work either. Should have said Walnut Grove, really, shouldn't I? It's like saying he's from, you know, the way, the back of beyond, Nazareth, way up there in Galilee, not from the big city, Vancouver. So that much they know. They know also that he was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. But actually, they'd hoped that he was going to be more than a prophet. Maybe the Messiah, who would come to redeem, meaning liberate Israel, not least from Roman rule. But certain leaders had handed Jesus over to the Romans to be crucified. That was three days ago. And the two disciples think that's the end of it all. But as we noted earlier, the, the women had reported that Jesus had risen, that the tomb was empty. And the angels had said that he is now alive. And while these two disciples had heard some confirm that the tomb was empty, they themselves had meet, seen no sign of Jesus. So they didn't know the whole story. Their hopes were dashed. They were dejected and grieving, going back home. And all this leads us to a third question. What are we to make of Jesus' response? Well, if the disciples are dejected, Jesus also seems to be a little bit perturbed, but for different reasons. He recognizes that he has to rebuke the two disciples because they're not able to understand their own scriptures and how it is these scriptures had anticipated in advance these events concerning Jesus. How foolish you are, he said in verse 25, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then he asked them a question again. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? and then enter his glory? A suffering, suffering Messiah was not the sort of the Messiah that these disciples had hoped for. But Jesus likely has in mind some of those Old Testament passages, such as the suffering servant texts, 
Think of Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5, which in part say this, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrowing and familiar with pain. He was pierced for our transgressions, and by his wounds we are all healed. And so then Jesus starts teaching them. As verses 25 to 27 show us, he begins with Moses and moves to the prophets. In a sense, he takes them through the text of the entire Old Testament narrative, explaining to them all that was said in the Scriptures concerning himself. And as they only later realize, by reading the Old Testament in relation to himself, Jesus had opened up the Scriptures, had awakened a burning in their hearts. Walter Moberly, an Old Testament scholar, puts it this way. Jesus cannot be understood apart from the Jewish, that is, the Old Testament Scripture. And the Jewish, the Old Testament Scriptures, cannot be understood apart from Jesus. In short, Jesus is the, himself the key to understanding the Bible. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament, taken together as they must be, Any reading of the Bible that does not include both the Old and the New Testament with Jesus at the center falls short of the fullness of the gospel. But the two disciples still have not recognized that they are talking with Jesus. So we need to consider verses 28 to 33 with a fourth question in mind. At what point do these disciples recognize the risen Jesus? And why, then, does he immediately disappear? Well, as they approach Emmaus, it's nearly nighttime, and the two disciples, hospitable as they are, invite Jesus to stay with them, and he does. Notice how Jesus, in verses 30 to 31, um, or sorry, Luke, in verses 30 to 31, describes their evening meal together. Quote, When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. This is the language of the Lord's Supper. Then their eyes were opened, and then they recognized him, and he disappeared out of their sight. Only now, when they welcome Jesus and share in prayer and communion, that is, deep fellowship with him, are they able to recognize his risen presence with them. Only now are they able to realize all that God has accomplished, the big picture, as Luke had put it in his preface, to fully see the events that had been fulfilled among them. Walter Moberly, again, um, tells us that What Luke is stressing here is that knowing who God is and understanding how in Jesus he has rescued and renewed all things is only recognized and actualized in the coming together of Scripture and communion, word and sacrament. For it's in this way that we too partake of Jesus and participate in his way of living in the world, the way of the cross, the way of suffering, the way of ultimate glorification. Scripture and communion, then, together. We don't do this alone. We do it together, gathered in worship, not least around the reading and proclamation of the Scriptures, and in sharing in communion with God and with one another. This kind of calling is attested, it's amplified in many passages in the New Testament. Uh, For example, Romans 12. Paul speaks there of our spiritual worship as one body gathered together who share the spiritual gifts in love of one another, in service of the Lord, extending hospitality, and living peaceably with all. So now that these two disciples 
can discern all of this, Jesus is able, able to leave them. He disappeared from their sight. Why? Because they have now encountered and more fully understood the risen Jesus through his exposition of the scriptures in relation to himself and through their communion with him. And so they are empowered to go to back to Jerusalem and to bear witness to all that they have seen and experienced. Well, some takeaways then on journeying with Jesus, scripture and communion. We need to take time with the scriptural text so that in the power of the Spirit, the text can take time with us. That involves reading it prayerfully, attentively, regularly, allowing God's Spirit to illuminate, to instruct, and encourage. Yes, we should read each passage in a way that appreciates its literary and historical setting. That's what biblical scholars like to do, but it's not the whole story. We also want to be alert to the role that Scripture plays, each passage plays, within Scripture overall so that we can see the contribution it makes to our understanding of God's picked big picture. Carolyn's illustration was so apt. Um, we need to see how the pieces of the puzzle are arranged. I'm going rogue right now because it reminds me of Irenaeus, an early church father, who said, who tried to illustrate how it is we're to understand Scripture. You're to think of it as a mosaic, and all the pieces of the mosaic have to be put have to be there, but have to be aligned in the right way, and the right way is the way that images forth Jesus. Any other reading of Scripture is a distorted and inadequate depiction of what Scripture has to tell us. And we should read in communion with God and his people as we participate in God's mission to the world. Well, with all this in mind, let's pray. Father, teach us how to read your word together in ways that are centered on Jesus and shaped by your spirit. Draw us ever closer in communion with you and with one another so that in this way we may journey together in faith, hope, and love on this day and in the days to come. Amen.